Tonight, we are so fortunate to have um, pop culture critic and curator Carlo McCormick um, to bring our fall 2016 weekly lineup um, to a close while officially opening the conversation on cause. The exhibition, Where the End Begins, curated by our own um, Andrea Carnes, opened last Thursday to a seemingly unmatched um, level of enthusiasm with long lines and record crowds. Um, as some of you know, Cos will be back later this month to speak on his work and his career, but for Tuesday evenings, we thought we would get the perspective of someone who knows the artist personally, but um, has also considered him within the context of art history. And there really is no better person for that job than Carlo McCormick. Some of you will, re will recall Carlo um, being here for the Tuesday evenings during um, the modern show Urban Theater New York in the 1980s. Um, as a longtime resident of New York, Carlo McCormick uh, is Carlo McCormick um, is often described as a leading New York art writer, pop critic, and champion of the quote downtown scene. Having curated the exhibition, the Downtown Show, the New York art scene from 1974 to 1984, which focused on the downtown um, quote no wave scene of the Lower East Side opening at uh, NYU and traveling to uh, the Andy Warhol Museum as well as the Austin Museum of Art. It was awarded uh, first place for the best thematic show in New York 2005-2006 by the International Association of Art Critics. Carlo has um, long been recognized for his work as a pop culture critic, curator, and senior editor of Paper Magazine. His numerous books, monographs, and catalogs include Beautiful Losers, Contemporary Art, and Street Culture. The Downtown Book, which of course goes with the Downtown Show, um, The New York Art Scene, 1974-1984, and Dondi White, Style Master General, as well as his work um, appearing in publications such as Aperture, Art in America, Art News, Art Forum, High Times, and Spin Magazine, and Vice. But it is Carlo's knowledge and relationship with the work of the artist known as Cause that brings him here tonight to present what he is calling Cause and Effect, um, in which he has graciously agreed to give us an art historical and cultural context with which to expand and maybe even complicate our perception of the artworks currently occupying the Modern's first four galleries. Please join me in welcoming Carlo McCormick. Uh, thanks, Terry. Uh, thanks for everyone for coming out, and always thanks to everyone at this museum because they always make it feel friendly and familiar to be here. So this is a little bit of a lark, what I'm doing. Uh, so if I fail, I hope you'll forgive me. But wh what I decided to do was Brian, uh, sorry, I, I know him as Brian, but Cause is, uh, is a big art collector and actually a really substantial art collector. And so I went to him, I said, well, why don't I try to do a lecture out of your art collection? So we're just going to look at work that he's bought. And uh, so I, I wanted to make it like cause and effect, but he chooses food a little too well for that. Mm -hmm. uh, but it is interesting to kind of see his diet and maybe out of this to kind of construct an alternative history of art over the last 50 or so years. And uh, to, to realize in this maybe that uh, even though he's fully postmodern, that uh, he's really savvy and and uh, and deeply understanding, profoundly so, of of the art that came before him. So the first one here is uh, Robert Crum, R. Crum, uh, and it is Mr. Natural. What's he high on? And it's from '86. And for those of you who aren't uh, familiar with Crum. Uh, you know, comics have been around f for a while, for strips, basically uh, 100 years old, uh, comic books a little later, 
And then in the 60s, underground comics emerged. And this was more of an adult and more of a countercultural uh, form. And it was deeply personal. So th this is a way we can see what Cause is looking at. He's looking at people who are taking the comic form, the cartoon form, and, and investing it with a kind of their own personal language. Uh, Crumb started a comic book called Zap Comics which launched the career, uh, it was the first time someone had done a comic book like that, and it launched the careers of Robert Williams and S. Clay Wilson and uh, Victor Moscoso, who I know causes collected as well, and uh, uh, S. Clay Wilson, I forget, a, a bunch of them. Uh, anyway, so that's, I'm just gonna give you these kind of brief histories and hopefully we'll piece something together here. Uh, it's funny because, it, I remember just going to him one time ago, how did you go from this hoodlum who was doing mischief on the street to this guy who was making toys and then like, I see you like, you know the entire art world now. And he goes like, who do you mean? I said, well like David Zwerner, he's like the most blue chip gallery on the planet, how do you know him? He goes, well I buy work from him. Well, David Zwerner represents Crum and, and, and this guy, uh, Raymond Pettibone. Uh, uh, Ray, uh, like Crum, uh, is somebody whose career starts out deeply uh, connected with music. Crum is one of his most famous pieces was the uh, cover for Cheap Thrills, Big Brother and the Holding Company. Uh, Pettibone uh, was, uh, did all the art for his brother's band called Black Flag, and which was a really seminal LA punk into hardcore band. Uh, I. I this one's, of course, called Squack, One Sober Icy Kiss. What, what I love about uh, Ray's work on the fact that he's just totally nuts is uh, it's, it's, it's really noir, and, and, but it, it, he gets really poetic with it. So it's like this really dark view, but it leaves a space for the imagination uh, that's really stunning and in and, and, and a very... Uh, these are him and Crum are coming out of narrative traditions, but they're breaking them down as much as they're they're uh, offering the, the typical storytelling. Uh, this is another LA guy, uh, super famous. He's dead now, so I shouldn't say anything bad about him. But he was a really horrible human being. His name's Mike Kelly, and um, th this piece is, uh, if I can say this on your podcast, it's called "Fuck Me, I'm Irish." And it's uh, from 2008 and 2009. Uh, I went and saw like this Martin Wong retrospective they had recently. This is Martin Wong. And I was kind of shocked to see that six of the paintings in the show actually belong to Cos. Uh, and I didn't even know he, Martin died of AIDS long before Brian, uh, before Cos was on the scene. And um, I was kind of like, you know, sort of, how did he know him? Uh, this piece is from 1979. It's called Tell My Troubles to the Eight Ball. So I guess the eight ball being that, remember that weird novelty thing where you had that thing and you'd ask it a question? So, it, it, you know, it's enigmatic like many of his things. He's very famous for painting bricks. Like this is kind of one of, uh, that's one of his uh, most known tropes. He wasn't super successful in his lifetime. Uh, he sold work, but mostly he sold his own work to buy graffiti art. Uh, but like right now, uh, Martin isn't like for New York, I just because I'm New York centric. He's owned by the Whitney. He's owned by the Metropolitan Museum of Art. He's owned by MoMA. He's like, he's one of these guys that people have begun belatedly to really respect uh, a kind of uh, romanticism uh, that he brought to the just the, the kind of ruins porn of like New York on the skids in the late 70s and early 80s. And I think it's interesting that Cause collected him because Cause is actually a huge graffiti art collector because he has a background in that. And Martin uh, created one of the largest, probably yeah, probably the largest, certainly the most important graffiti art collection in his lifetime. And when he was dying, he donated to the Museum of the City of New York, and it's now kind of celebrated as this historical treasure trove. And uh, so I, it's kind of an interesting 
homage in that way as well. So I'm gonna show you a little bit, uh, a fraction of the graffiti art he's collected. This is a really early piece by Lee Quinones. Uh, Lee uh, was one of the master subway writers. They're, they're all pretty much uh, master. These are all kind of, it's a pantheon of, of New York City subway art I'll give you. Uh, th this was something he kind of brought out recently and these were his sketchbooks from when he was a kid. Uh, he's kind of like, maybe he's a few years older than me, uh, you know, but I, he's definitely a teenager when he's making this. And you can see uh, that this kind of, this uh, whole new genre that was, was kind of erupted as a, as a renaissance in the late 70s and early 80s on the trains, that one of the things they were looking at is that they were all looking at comic books. So what is that, is that like, Dr. Doom there or something? Was, but anyway, Lee has quit. So that would probably be one of his, like, he always wanted to, like, do farewell pieces and stuff like that. And, but, of course, he, he didn't quit. And uh, So one of the ways Ka started collecting before he became a successful artist was he traded work. And he traded immediately with uh, the older generation, but kind of a peer group of graffiti artists. And uh, uh, Johnny Matos, uh, John Matos is Crash. And that was an early guy who just understood right off that, that Cause was special. And he just traded work with him. So this is just a, a drawing from 83. and a painting from, uh, I think, the same year, 84, no. Uh, Crash is uh, really interesting also, is, is someone to keep in mind when you think about uh, Cause's work, because Crash was the guy, and of course, I'm working with his examples, so <laughs> I guess if I was doing this with, I would pull different ones from, uh, from art history itself, but I'm just working with his collection, but he was the guy who really brought pop art sensibilities to graffiti art. It all looked like a, like Lichtenstein exploding a, a Warhol or something like that. So, uh, and it's, he's super tight and well rendered and very pop. Zephyr, Andy was a early writer. He's very much retired from the art world now, but uh, super influential. He was actually a, uh, just to, just to kind of go through this is like, there's this sense that because hip hop got so big, we have this idea that graffiti art was this uh, black, uh, you know, African American urban experience of poor kids. It wasn't. Uh, it was all over. Lee was a, a Puerto Rican guy uh, on the Lower East Side in my neighborhood. Uh, Crash was uh, uh, Johnny, uh, I think, also uh, Latin uh, up in the Bronx. Zephyr was a, a kind of a pretty posh kid from the Upper East Side of New York. Um, and this is called Diabolical Dice Up. This is also a Zephyr. And when you get into Wild Style, it's kind of hard to read this stuff, I understand, but that is Zephyr's name there. But it's interesting because if you, if you look at this show, you see the way Cause is kind of mangling the, the known forms. Uh, it's kind of spliced and cut up and rearranged and things like that. It's one of the things that's most striking about the way his work evolved. Well, that was that kind of play with form, uh, that kind of, uh, kind of mutant sensibility uh, of wild style is something maybe genetically encoded in him as somebody who kind of came up studying graffiti. This is one of the, the style master. This is Dondi White. Uh, Beautiful soul, uh, he died uh, as well. Uh, AIDS took him too, we lost many. Uh, this is a dark continent of kings. Uh, probably the, the, really the great draftsman of, of the movement. This guy could just draw lines that were so seductive and, and, and told you so much with so little. Uh, this is, cause I didn't, yeah, it comes out. I can't see it on my screen here, but this is, uh, it's, it's called Pre-2. A lot of these uh, graffiti artists, even though they're famous for their graffiti name, like Dondi, uh, they also, part of their play was that they just make up other names. And so he was trying out a name here called Pre-2, which I think works really nice with this one uh, from his collection. Uh, this is called Post-Age. 
right? So it's not post, it is postage, but it's two different words. And so you can see it's from 1984, and he, he's playing with that, but he's also 84, I mean, 84 is kind of around the time that there was this huge show called Post Graffiti at Sydney Janus. Post is in the air, we're slipping, we're having that kind of uh, loss of traction that led us into postmodernism with a certainty uh, of, of that whole modernist project was, was slipping, and, and this is just his very intuitive uh, kind of play on it. Uh, this is Phase 2, an untitled work from 1984. Phase 2 is often forgotten in the history books, but is actually probably one of the most important artists. He was the first guy who really had the big picture, who was starting to do flyers for the famous early beginnings of hip hop, uh, did IG Times, did all, the, uh, all this really seminal work. He's just an incredibly uh, angry person, so he's never really interfaced with the art world as well as he, he should have or could have, because he's certainly, in terms of merit uh, and, and just pure innovative uh, uh, will, he's, he's certainly an important artist. Uh, again, like just to talk about how different uh, it is phase two is the quintessential angry black man. Scene was this guy, uh, Richie, uh, kind of a, I don't know, like such a knucklehead, what can I say? He's like this Bronx guy uh, into heavy metal. Uh, the, but the thing was, is his family, their, their, uh, their backyard basically uh, led on to these train yards where they parked the train. So he, it was his playground, and he was called, the, him and his brother were like the king of the six, which was a six train, and he just dominated it. So this is just a, a painting from his from 85. I think he's living in Vegas now, this guy. And this is really one of the greats and one of the people who uh, deeply influenced cause. Uh, uh, not not necessarily stylistically, but he's the guy who kicked open the doors. Futura 2000. So Futura is uh, one of these early early writers. He's the guy who actually brought abstraction uh, into the visual language of graffiti. His cars often look like Kandinsky paintings. Uh, really, like just using the spray to create these incredible atmospheric sort of things, but. Uh, it's a good example of the kind of work uh, he's known for. And the thing was, is graffiti had its 15 minutes of fame and, you know, proverbial 15 minutes, and then it really got the bum rush out the door. So you had this situation by the mid-80s where uh, you had artists, you know, barely in their 20s. They've had shows at major galleries. They've had, you know, uh, major museum shows, all this stuff like that, and then all of a sudden they can't get run over by an ice cream truck on a sunny day. And uh, Futura, Lenny, uh, he, he, he had fans around the world, and they were all kind of wanted to help him, and he created different ideas, different genres out of it. So one of the things he did is, he, he like streetwear, which is, this idea that like something which is so common and quotidian to the language of youth culture now that uh, every t-shirt, like I'm wearing a cost shirt, but the t-shirts are kind of a language by which people communicate with each other. Well, this was it, like the t-shirt could become a canvas for your art. But he also was one of the first guys doing toys, which is how cost uh, uh, gets his start. And so it's a bunch of people, Agnes B, the famous designer in Paris, uh, James Lavelle, a famous record producer in London, and Nigo, a famous uh, kind of urban streetwear guy in Japan. He worked with all of them, and then he just opened up this thing which now we take for granted as kind of urban youth marketing. And one last one from Futura. This is from 85. So I'm trying to do them chronologically within the artists. So that's 83 to 85. Ram LZ, a legend, he died not long ago. Uh, he, he's been sampled a lot because he had a crazy rap style, but he invented this kind of really elaborate global view, uh, uh, this iconic panzerism, and, and his idea was that like somehow 
this language-based art of graffiti was too passive, and this whole idea was this kind of m militaristic arming of the letters. And, and so these are all kind of these war things. Uh, the, the first one was called Metropolis Stanzer the Zipper. This is Atomic Futurism Neutron, Neutron spelled N-E-W-T-R-O-N, a bug out from 86, and Lust from 1996. This would be a, a later work. Uh, Cause has a very large collection of Keith, of Keith Haring's work. I think that um, it, it shouldn't surprise any of us, should it, right? It's, uh, it, it, this is somebody who, uh, he didn't fall, the apple didn't fall far from that tree. And, and Keith, Keith's a really important uh, guy to keep in mind in terms of this alternative history we're talking about because uh, Keith wasn't stupid, and he certainly uh, and he was quite successful, and he had some of the smartest uh, minds in the art world kind of whispering in his ear. And they were saying, like, you know, Keith, like, stop, like, signing every little black book and stop doing drawings on people's jackets and just stop giving your art away for free. And, and, and you know, for goodness sake, like, don't do these you know, cheap t-shirts and, and, you know, it's really, it's tacky, it's commercial work. And Keith always thought like, well, I can sell a painting for $500,000 or I can sell like 100,000 t-shirts for like much cheaper and still make the same money and then the people can have it. So uh, his response was he opened something called the pop shop and that really was a big game changer. And, and that was this idea that, that uh, product, that, that this thing which is, Artist multiples aren't really that old. They kind of start in the 50s, Fluxus, and then the pop artists do it. And it's really, a, it's a recent history, but the artist multiple was always handcraft. And Keith went like, no, posters, refrigerator magnets, t-shirts, whatever. We can do this thing with actual commercial production now. I can go to China and have these things made, just like Donald Trump does. And, uh, <laughs> And, and so he kind of blew open all these things. And so anyway, this is just a nice piece. He, uh, Kaz has got some really significant pieces, these tart paintings he made for Shafrazi back in the 80s, which are monumental and would look good in the museum if you can ever get him to do a show for you of those things. Uh, contemporary of, uh, of Keith Haring, another artist who, like Keith, uh, died of AIDS and was highly politicized by that is this artist David Vonarovich. Um, David's actually gonna have a big retrospective of his work coming up at the Whitney. Uh, he, you know, I don't know how much he, he impacted cause, but I'll tell you, he changed my life. He was a, uh, a good friend and a huge influence on me. This is like this screaming bird he did on a trash can lid. And this is kind of part of, you know, uh, I do have a little bit of this downtown history. This was kind of part of the aesthetic of like taking the garbage off the street and doing this kind of incredible alchemy of turning shit into gold and, and making wonderful things out of this world and out of this culture which had been discarded. I um, mean, you have to remember this is... This is from, I gotta look it up, this is from 83. This is a time when, you know, most of America had quite rightly hated New York. That, you know, it's, uh, we were like kind of this despised, horrible place filled with drug addicts and queers and, and all sorts of, you know, the wrong kind of people. And, and so the people who were there were really bonded by their, their freakishness, by their otherness, but also very much celebrating that thing. Like I told you, Martin Wong, doing these decaying, collapsing tenement brick buildings as if they were like the most gorgeous, you know, Caspar David Friedrichs or something. Okay, and then I think we're wrapping up people who came out of uh, graffiti. This is from 1993. Uh, this is Barry McGee, who, this is kind of right around the time I met Barry. Uh, Portland, San Francisco artist, been in like the Venice Biennale and things like that. I remember him telling me years ago, the, the more, famous I get in the art world, the less fans I have. And that's kind of happened. He doesn't have quite as many fans as someone like Hawes does, but he's a uh, very well-established artist. And, uh, and this would be more, more recent work. This is, I mean, it's still relatively old, it's 2012, but this is kind of what he's doing now. His uh, wife who passed away from cancer uh, was Margaret Kilgowan. She was very interested in sign painting, so you see a little bit of that in the left there, and then 
this kind of collage technique and his crazy characters. Just a really eccentric guy. It was called the Mission School. If anyone wants to check that stuff out, it was just this really out there weird moment in San Francisco where all these uh, people were just doing really personal idiosyncratic work which didn't have anything to do with what anyone else was doing anywhere else. It was like just like, it took us all wonderfully by surprise. This is one of the artists that uh, I can thank Cause for turning me on to. I had no idea. Uh, these are from, this is from 69, and this is from 1972. The guy's name is Ray Yoshida, and he was the old professor at the Art Institute of uh, Chicago, and he was the teacher for all the Chicago images. So that whole pantheon of famous artists that came out of Chicago, this was their teacher. And look how, I mean, look how wild this is, right? And this is, if you see the kind of uh, crazy cut and paste sort of ideas that, that causes working out in, in this show, you can go like, wow, this guy was kind of thinking that way in 67. I love that one. Okay, so now I'll do a little bit of Harry Who because he's he doesn't really he didn't go for the images so much, um, like the Roger Browns and the Ed Paschkeys and stuff like that. I'm not saying he hates them; he just didn't collect them. What he went for was this very odd little moment in Chicago history called Harry Who, and originally the idea would be H A R R Y Harry Who. You know, like it was at a time when you could say that the art world <laughs> was. Well, one is the art world, not a pretentious place, but it was doing these shows which would be called like 16 Americans or new minimalists, like really tight. Like, and they were just like, they decided to like do, and they all got called Harry Who. They were deeply influenced by comics, by, this is 60s, by underground culture, by stuff like that. So these are both, as are two pieces uh, sharing the same thing. Uh, I can't even read my handwriting. Um, Nude worse, worse. Oh, nude nurse. I'm sorry. Uh, uh, no, no, nurse worse. <laughs> sorry. <laughs> on the left, nurse worse, and corner kite birdman on the right. Uh, this is one other Carl Worsom from later 1980, back to Bay Six. And then Jim Nutt was one of the. Again, his work's so great, this is, happens to be the one cause has, or the one cause has it. He shared an image with me of, but he's somebody so irrational and hilarious. These guys were really funny. Uh, this is a Jim Nutt, kind of later, late 70s, called We're Late. Now, this is really one of the most it causes really collected, like a real set of oddballs, I gotta say. But this is the oddest cat of the world. And if you really want to talk about the quintessential artist artists, you, you'd like if you looked it up in a dictionary, it would be a picture of H.C. Westerman. And so he's he dies like in 81. I know because I was just about to meet him and <laughs> then he died. <laughs> so I never did get to meet him. And he was a hero, and, and he was a hero to many of us, and he's just his work is kind of indescribably out there. A lot of people have associated it with Dada. A lot of people talked about how conceptualism and even minimalism came out of him. Um, a lot of people think of Joseph Cornell with his work. But um, he was born in 22, and he was a Marine in World War II, and uh, uh, saw some pretty heavy action in the Pacific, including a whole boat with 800 people blowing up in front of him. And, and he would always talk about the, the smell of death. And uh, then he became an acrobat and toured Asia with <laughs> this showgirl who he married. And then kind of, Post-war, 47, he goes to Chicago, I think. I think it was a Chicago Art Institute. Studies art, uh, gets disillusioned with the art world. But then his 
his showgirl wife leaves him. And so the next thing, because he, he was so inspired by that kind of greatest generation thing of World War II, he, um, I'll show you a few other ones. He, he joins the Korean War, which was kind of one of our many stupid wars after we were the good guys, and ends up kind of dedicating the rest of his life to talking about, uh, you know, to be anti-militaristic and also anti-materialist. And, and it's just really odd, odd work to try to describe. I, I, it's rare when I have to admit that language fails me with H.C. Westerman. This is Man with Airplane. This is the, the first two were from the 60s, and this is from 74. Uh, George Kondo, Gray Nude Profile from 2011. By chance, I, was, I, I ran into George like two, three days ago in New York. And I said to him, oh, you know, I was just looking at a picture of yours. I'm putting it in a talk. And he's, a, and he's like looking at me like, really? Why are you talking about me? <laughs> and I'm like, well, because I'm doing this thing about, uh, of causes collection. And he's got a whole bunch of your work. And he was flummoxed. He, he didn't know. So a lot of artists, like they trade work, things like that. Cause buys it and the, you know, from people. And, and George was so happy. He goes, really, really? Like, he's one of my favorite artists. I can't believe it. And George is like, he's a you know, very different kind of painter. And uh, like, if you see the kind of precision and meticulousness of Cause's work, George is like, you know, he's really fluent and fluid and, and, and he, doesn't, he doesn't make any bad moves, really. But he's insanely prolific. And, and I remember him telling me once, like, because... Uh, he was going like, you know, if somebody tried to write every word that Shakespeare ever wrote between the sonnets and the plays, it, it would take him a lifetime. If someone ever, you know, tried to write every note that Bach ever wrote, it would take him two lifetimes. He goes like, I want to make so much work that if people tried to copy, it would take him like five lifetimes. And so anyway, this is just a beautiful piece. Yeah, OK, so now uh, we're, we're moving pretty good here. How am I doing? Oh, good, good, good. I'm not gonna, no one's gonna have to miss the uh, World Series for me. Uh, uh, this is uh, Eric Parker, and uh, he's got a bunch of work from Eric, and I kind of wanted to include him. I, I actually asked him uh, for some of Eric's work because Eric is a strong artist. He shows with Paul Kasman, uh, very trippy, just like Cause's work, and the main thing is that they're like best buddies, and it's really interesting to, to, to see how their work can be so different, but they can be like really kindred souls. And, and I, I just wanted to show his work because he's an important artist and he's well known, but he's certainly not well, uh, as famous as Casa. The first one was called Keep It Together, and this one is called Runs Deep, but in parentheses. So, uh, Eric's early work was all like kind of hippie doodle stuff, like just the kind of thing of some kid smoking too much pot and like just draws all these things with words, you know, kind of notebook art. And it's, it's really evolved and he's just a really masterful painter now. And, and he breaks down um, colors in really interesting ways in the same way that you can see these kind of prim primary and primal colors with cause, the, the kind of, uh, the way you kind of make a composition out of things that are rather jarring next to each other. It's just an interesting thing that they're together. Okay, now, this is, this is the part where I've fallen off the ledge and I've, uh, into a deep ocean of water that I don't know where I am because these are, I'm gonna end it with two artists who uh, Cause totally turned me on to. And, uh, and it's typical of his kind of esoteric uh, tastes and knowledge uh, that he'd know them and, and he was twice his age doesn't. Uh, the, the first one is, is uh, Keiichi Tanami, and then we're gonna do uh, Tadanori Yoku next. But these are both uh, psychedelic pop artists from the 60s from Japan. Uh, Tanami uh, is like, I don't know if anyone remembers Murakami's ideas about Big Brother and the little bomb and the, things like that, that basically Japanese pop was born out of the trauma 
of uh, Hiroshima and Nagasaki. And that it's like, and kawaii is the word they use for like called super cute, that all these things stem out of this, not an amnesia, but more like a trauma, uh, a denial and things like that. And this is something uh, that Tanami wrote uh, about, he was nine years old during the kind of, uh, the great air raid of Tokyo. Uh, in 1945, I think that was. I'm a, I write really small, so I'm going to read it like this. <clears throat> I was rushed away from my childhood, a time that should have been filled with eating and playing, by the enigmatic monstrosity of war. My dreams were a vortex of fear and anxiety, anger and resignation. On the night of the air raid, I remember watching swarms of people flee from bald mountaintops. But then something occurs to me. Was that moment real? Dream and reality are mixed up in my memories, recorded permanently in an ambiguous way. Uh, so it's a little different kind of psychedelia than we're, we're experiencing in the 60s. And um, he would come to New York in 67 to look at Warhol's work uh, firsthand. He did like record covers for the Japanese issues of like, and they're so, like go online and look at them. They're like the wildest art you've ever seen for, for bands like uh, Jefferson Airplane or the Monkees. And it's like <laughs> way, way more outre than what we were, than the packaging in the States. And he was also influenced by like Fluxus with Yoko Ono and Nam June Paik, who are, you know, important uh, Asian artists there. And also very active in anti-war stuff. This one is, uh, let me go with, uh, this one's called Strip Tease. And it's kind of got that vagina dentata thing going there. And I kind of hope that the next woman Trump decides to grab ha has that an anatomical feature. <laughs> this is called Alice. Uh, I-N-G-A-K-O-U, I'm not going to butcher it. This is from 71, it's a little later. And this is the last one I, ha I have from him. This is really, it's, well, really late for him. It's 77, it's called Kodachrome. Okay, so this one came with no information. He kind of forgot to label this, this JPEG for me. But I'm guessing this is uh, Tadanori Yoku. Certainly the, all the other ones are. He was a graphic designer, illustrator, printmaker, and, and really huge uh, pop artist in Japan in the 60s, <coughs> uh, often compared to like the Pushpin Studio artists, you know, like Milton Glaser, but also Peter Max and, 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 and Warhol to some degree as well. Um, but I don't know if any, any of them are apt descriptions. But anyway, sometime in the 80s, he decided to start painting. And so these are his paintings from then. Uh, and, and collages, as we can see. And the thing was, is even though he was, <coughs> and I think both these artists, by the way, were included in those shows, uh, Global Pop and all the, there's been an effort. One was at the Walker, one was at the Pompidou Center in Paris um, to kind of go, well, you know, we have this canon of American pop, but pop actually happened. Pop art happened all over the world. So it's a way of looking at art from Asia, from South America, from like Eastern Europe, from all these places. And it's kind of stunning and, and, and especially stunning because it, it makes you recognize the incredible level of ignorance and bias by which most of us construct our art history. But anyway, it's interesting because Yoku, uh, oh, these are great, these like kind of fake Henri Rousseau's he was doing. Look at this, this is totally great. That he had like incredible like pop art skills, but then like really got into kind of primitivism, like folk art stuff. But anyway, uh, he was really influenced actually by Kurosawa, uh, was like, a, you know, really close. And then uh, Yukio Mishima, I don't know if you're f familiar with his work, but uh, you're certainly an important filmmaker as well. And I came across this thing that Mishima wrote about Yoku. And he goes, Tadanori Yoku's works reveal all of the unbearable things which we Japanese have inside of ourselves. And, uh, this is like, 
you can tell it's not a good translation, sorry. Uh, all the unbearable things we Japanese have inside ourselves, and they make people angry and frightened. He makes explosions with a frightening resemblance, which lies between the vulgarity of billboards advertising variety shows during festivals at the shrine devoted to the war dead, and the red containers of Coca-Cola and American pop art. Things which are in us, but which we do not wish to see. So it's, I like, I like his heavy, this one's called Heavy Smoker. And again, done in that Henri Rousseau style, it's kind of great. It's, it's really funny. So I, I, I oh, <laughs> how lovely is this one? I got to look at the title. It's, it's too good. It's called uh, Poor Abandoned Child. <laughs> so that's kind of, this is the play that you still get with Murakami and with all these other artists now, you know, getting big out of Japan, is the way that the super cute can be invested with this this kind of underlying pathos. And I think this is kind of, uh, if, we, if we think of the companion, if we think of the great sculpture out there, some of these works here, I, it's, uh, it's like, it's really cute in Disney, but it's like Disney characters having a, a really bad day. You know, and I think that, uh, that they're epic and they're beautiful and they're seductive, but really what they are is they're vulnerable. And that's really where they allow us in. They're having really, their cartoons having really human moments, really emotional crises. And, and, and I think that, you know, that's, if you ask me why I love Cause's work, is because he allows that to happen. And, and it's, it's something which uh, uh, speaks to a frailty we, we don't always have. And, the, and these are this last two. This one's called The World. And these are recent ones. These are 2015. So he's not just buying the old work, he goes right up to the moment. And this is called Ptolemaic System. So I think I left some time for some questions, I hope. I don't know what you could ask after I just blathered on about that, but hopefully it's something. Oh, I think that was amazing. Um, I'm going to try this. We did this last week. So if you have a question, I will find you. And this way it'll be better on the podcast and everybody can hear the questions. And because it always takes a group a little time to warm up, I will, <laughs> I'll remind you guys, which you um, didn't have an opportunity to see, Carlo, but we have an Eric Parker upstairs. Oh, you do? Super yeah. cool. So if you haven't been upstairs to see the permanent collection, there's an Eric Parker up there. And Eric Parker was one of the focus show artists after Cause was a focus show artist. There we go. And, and all of this comes together because Barry McGee preceded Cause as a focus art, show artist. Do some of you remember that? that the there I was. I was work? trying to be obscure, and you're already there. <laughs> no, there was plenty of obscurity. <laughs> I, I'm, I'm definitely going back to the podcast to do some Googling of some of these artists, especially these last few. So um, does anybody have any questions? This is your opportunity. This guy knows everything. <laughs> Who? OK, good job. I'm going to try to run as fast as I can. Yeah, you do, because uh, I know you can build it out. By any chance, does Cause collect comic books and comic book art? Is you know, that, is that part of I, I haven't seen that, but you know, I, I I would imagine at some point he's got to be like one of those weird geeky kids, don't you think? But I haven't seen that. You know, I haven't seen a record collection or a comic book collection or a toy collection even. So, uh, but you know, you know, it's fed him at somewhere along the line. Yeah, yeah. Well, well, that was kind of one of the things which led into this big toy explosion, which he kind of caught right at the right time um, and, and kind of raised to another level, is uh, Japan fetishized aspects of American popular culture, as we can see in the art, but also just in their things. And, and, and they got into collecting old toys, like really bad uh, dye injected like Godzilla bits of plastic from the, like the, the 50s and 60s all of a sudden became collectible and that, as did like kind of old jeans and things like that. So they kind of created this, this thing which was beginning the, to aestheticize a very disposable culture. So yeah, that, it definitely comes from those old like 50s wind up robots and stuff like that. Hi, I just wanted to thank you. This is the first time I understood what is pop culture. Thanks. That's super nice. Thanks. Anybody else? 
Okay, I'm going to continue to talk and while you guys form a question. Um, one of the things that I was hoping you might speak to is, you, you hit on it a little bit, the, the kind of darker side, which is, becomes a point of entry for us into to causes work in a way. Um, given what you know about um, this genre and, and all of the referencing to cartoons and such throughout the work of a lot of these artists, um, can you talk a little bit or has there been much written on the psychology of these cartoons that we watch and our children watch and we accept as being kind of this innocent entertainment but in fact are, have their own agenda? And yeah, I mean, I think, I think so. I mean, I mean, going back to comics, there was uh, the comic industry, very much like the Hayes Code, changed Hollywood forever because there was a scandal with Fatty Arbuckle. I don't want to get back into the weeds on history, but all of a sudden Hollywood was a bunch of pornographers and so Hollywood came up with its rating system and it kind of ran all these things out. The same thing sort of happened with comics. There was this, uh, this guy is kind of like an acolyte of McCarthy. He's like McCarthy is kind of thinking and he wrote this book called The, the Seduction of the Innocents. And he blamed everything on comics. And so it ran all these things like EC Comics with two-fisted tales and tales from the crypt. It ran all those things out because comics needed a little stamp of approval. And you couldn't get into any store if you didn't have that stamp of approval. The same way like if you had an X rating, it really limited your audience. So it was a kind of self-censorship. And, and so, com you know, it was actually the, the irony of that was the, the people who were most affected by it, which was EC Comics, this guy William Gaines started something which no one could argue with and truly changed American culture, which was called Mad Magazine. And Mad Magazine, the way they began, I remember Gloria Steinem, the great feminist, uh, saying like, well, Mad Magazine made us laugh at ourselves. And by laughing at ourselves, we were allowed to question our culture because of before it was so consensus. So, the, the, these things have kind of uh, slipped in there, but I remember as a kid, like this, it would it would range from like uh, Three Stooges to Tom and Jerry. This notion of cartoon violence somehow corrupting, but cartoon violence, slapstick, these things are are, are radical, ribald things that don't just go in American culture. Like French playwrights were working with them a century beforehand. And, and it is a really subversive thing. It's sort of like why clowns can get away with, with more than like, you know, political commentators. It, it, it's a license for this stuff. I don't know if that answers your question. But. No, that's great. Uh, and I'm, what's kind of, I'm curious about seeing cause is, um, oh, for example, the Smurfs. And that, yeah. you know, what, what are, you know, I know that there's just been, uh, that philosophy and psychology has kind of had a heyday with the Smurfs and the notion of this, you know, internal little community, this utopian situation. Yeah. And I don't know, I just, and I don't, I think if we ask. I'm, I was probably a little too old for Smurfs, but I found them deeply disturbing. I remember it's the sort of like, same way Teletubbies kind of really kind of like, whoa, this is like, this is a little, if I watch this anymore, I'm going to get diabetes. It's so sweet. <laughs> but uh, I will tell you, like, uh, when uh, Cos gave my kid a painting when he was a kid, which is really super nice. Uh, and it's, it's really funny, but uh, my kid's two favorite things were Astro Boy, which was a really great Japanese cartoon, for those of you who might remember that, and uh, Pokemon, <laughs> right? <laughs> Before Pokemon Go, but it was, you know, you got to get them all. So, uh, Kaz made a painting for my kid, which is Astro, it's in a wrestling rink, and it's Astro Boy with his foot on Pikachu, <laughs> right? In the, and, and Pikachu's like, like that. And he's pulling out Pikachu's guts. And it's totally like, wow, you know, it's like, so he, he can go there. He doesn't often, but, you know, he, he, can, he can get into the viscera of it all. And I sort of would imagine, you knowing him, you'll know the answer to this, but I would imagine that he, would, he wouldn't go there. Like, if we ask him that question, he would deny that it had anything more than just, yeah. you know, he just watched Smurfs as a kid. So yeah, what, no, and I think he's really, like, He's using this language, but I think 
uh, he's really sophisticated, and I think he's really using them for very formalist ways. I mean, right. I don't, I don't really think that uh, that yeah, the language is is pure pop culture, but actually the the ideas, the the compositional integrity, things like that. These are, you know, he's you can he's looking at fine art actually. Right. Yeah. The more abstract they get, the more obvious yeah. or apparent that becomes. Does anybody else want to? Yes, sir. All right, I'm just going to throw some words at you first. Um, I want to think about the exhibit in terms of uh, displacement. And um, I think the, the first part of your um, show did a really nice job of showing a movement through graffiti, in, in particular, the idea of the signature and the logo and the movement of that into the icon and character and then to sort of tie that into this show, into the silhouette. Mm -hmm. And then as we get to the silhouette, which is iconic in this show, we have a, a lot of silhouettes that are displaced. They're overwritten. So you can see Mickey Mouse, but then whatever on is displayed on Mickey Mouse is not representative of Mickey Mouse. It's a displacement. So I was wondering if you could tie yeah, that into your presentation. That's actually really well said. And, and I think there, there, is a, there is an interesting lineage that way. Because uh, you mentioned branding. And really, if you actually look at what graffiti artists were doing, they were writing their name over and over and over again, not too dissimilar from the way Coca-Cola operates, right? Uh, creating recognizable things, make, making it, you know, as they did it more and more with their tag, they'd made it, you know, incredibly recognizable. And, and it's this kind of deep branding where uh, uh, it works on, on any level, the way like, Ivan Chermayoff, who's one of the great fathers of that, who did like the Chase Manhattan Bank Octagon or the PBS Triple Figure. He did all the NBC Peacock. He did all these major kind of things like that. The idea is, is that like it will work really small on a business card. It will, and it will work really huge in a corporate lobby. It is part of this the kind of this overall aesthetic. So you know, branding, I guess we can say, goes back to. Well, it goes back to Texas, probably with <laughs> somebody with a really hot piece of metal sticking it on a cow's butt. Uh, but th this is this is what branding kind of is, uh, and it, it it sears the mind. And I I think he's he learned a lot of lessons from that. And cause is a, above all else at this point is a brand as well. Uh, go visit the gift shop if you don't believe it. And so he's, uh, I think they've, they've mastered it. They kind of intuitively understood it, this, this generation of kids. Is that, is that, I don't know if that's an answer to your question, but I really liked what you said. Thank yeah. you. Yeah, yeah, that's, that's great. Yeah. That's an answer in one direction. Yeah. <laughs> um, I have a two-part question. First, um, I came in a little late. I don't know if he has any of the more recent artists like Banksy, Jeff Koons. And also, as regards to toys, why vinyl? I mean, um, most art we think should last 100 years if you're painting and you're printing. Should be papers that don't turn brown easily. Do these vinyls, um, are they gonna last really long? Why vinyl? Why not glass, ceramic? Oh, uh, well, of course he does, you know, uh, vinyl, the, the reason just on a practical thing, the reason why vinyl came about was it, it became this, this uh, rapid imaging uh, thing. It was like the way you could take something out of a computer and actually make an object with it right away, a prototype, and then cast it. And vinyl was the easiest way to do it and the most efficient and the most affordable for like this collector's market. Uh, as you see with all these big sculptures here, uh, they're all actually no longer of these kind of uh, more, I mean, I think your vinyl figures will probably last your lifetime at least. Uh, if you're trying to talk about the pantheon of, you know, of course you need to always work in, in bronze or marble or something like that if you want to 
make these things survive uh, nuclear wars. But so, so that's one thing. But what was the other part was? Oh, about what? Okay, about his collection. Okay, so uh, I think what we can say about uh, his collection uh, is that he's he's also grabbing undervalued artists. He's like a smart collector. I wouldn't say people who are buying Jeff Koons are smart collectors. Sorry, they're not. They're they're uh, they're buying status and they're. They're moving money around. There's all, all sorts of reasons why the art market works that way. When he's buying an H.C. Westerman or when he's buying these Japanese artists that I haven't even heard of, he's, you know, he's getting them for, they're undervalued in the market. And I think that's part of, part of what's going on. He's not trying to buy status. He's not trying to be like, look, I'm so successful. I just bought a huge Warhol. He's like looking for things that he thinks or that he cares about and that he can afford and that he thinks, you know, he can draw attention to that way. That's my guess. I don't like to speak for him, but I, I, I guess that would be a fair way to put it. If he um, likes to collect or kind of looks for undervalued art, um, I wonder how come there was no women artists in this collection that we just saw? Which yeah, like that's that the, these, are, these are the slides actually, and I don't think he chose them. I think it's the woman who runs the studio. Uh, you know, uh, I did notice that. I'm, I'm not. Uh, uh, I, I have a. I'm. I'm from a generation that was, you know, PC before other people started railing against it. So I actually do those head counts, and I, and I did kind of like wince about that. I, I will say there because of graffiti, there's many people of color. But uh, yeah, no, that's, that's weird. And I know he has, uh, he does collect women artists. Uh, uh, the, the, he's collected a lot of that, the one woman who was associated with Harry, who, whose name I'm going blank on because I don't have a great memory. But he, uh, and his wife, uh, Julia Chang's a really amazing artist. Uh, and he supported uh, many women artists, but yeah, it's, it's an odd thing that, uh, we, I showed 54 images, and not one of them is by a woman. I'm aware of that, but I don't, you know, I don't think. I think they were just. This happened. He got me these images while he was working down here on this show, right after his kid was born. I don't think it was a big selection process. In fairness to him, and and I think it was uh, uh, this girl in the studio who actually just put it together. Um. Uh, just to continue that question just a little bit, and then we probably ought to call it a night, but um, your, with your experience, is there um, within the graffiti um, world, are women much of a, are they players in that world? I mean, I know I'd say like more so with street art now. Street art's opened up a, a lot more of, of these possibilities. Uh, there were important, you know, like Lady Pink was was certainly one of the, uh, first generation important uh, artists of that thing. That there were women in the mix, uh, but I think street art is it's much more. So I just curated a street art show in Germany, and I had, I, I you know I think I had a, a, at least a half dozen really strong women artists in it. Okay. But yeah, I think there was probably something. You know, graffiti was kind of coming out of gang culture, and it was bunch of juvenile boys, you know, climbing over fences and running over third rails and things. And, and it was probably a little more macho than that. Uh, mm -hmm. But there were some fierce women in that mix even back then. Mm -hmm. And could you just make the distinction between with street art versus graffiti, maybe? Okay, yeah. So uh, street arts... Street arts existed quite a while. I mean, you can basically say when graffiti exploded on the sub, uh, subways and it kind of turned our black and white world technicolor, uh, you couldn't be an artist and not be kind of getting high off the, the paint, the spray paint fumes. Everyone was intoxicated by it. And so a number of artists, even back then, including Keith Haring, who we saw tonight, started looking at those strategies of, of addressing public stray, space out of, based out of their studio practice, but doing kind of uncommissioned public art. So it, it kind of goes back to then, and artists have often done this, even before all that stuff. But so uh, 
More recently, you mentioned Banksy. He's sort of, you know, Shepard Ferry is another one. These are artists who are working uh, with public art, uh, but in different forms than just the kind of writing their name. It's, it's, uh, it, it, it would be too hard to characterize it more than that because it's all so different, but uh, basically that's the idea is, is people uh, doing interventions in the quotidian urban space just to kind of disrupt your normal reality to make you laugh or to make you question things. And that's really what street art is. That's so good. This whole evening has been so informative and enlightening. I really appreciate you coming in. Thanks. Thanks, everyone. Appreciate it.